we're taking a look at V8, the JavaScript engine that runs Chrome and Chromium and Microsoft Edge and everything else that's built on Chrome. And probably, I think, also Node. Uh, this is a big and intensely technical project, and we're only devoting half an hour to it. Uh, so uh, we're just going to scratch the surface. We're going to give the surface a teensy tiny little scratch on its nose, uh, and, and that's that. I'm going to look at the GitHub mirror. The official code repo is in what I assume is Garrett. It's some Git tiles thing, and I do like Garrett, but I don't really like Git tiles as a as an explorey thing. Yeah, this looks totally like Garrett. Okay. All right. And Node. Yep. Cool. Okay. So this is the V8 JavaScript engine. This, what's going on here is that uh, my understanding, I wasn't there, is that the idea was to make the browser usable as a uh, way to deliver apps so that Google could compete, for example, with Microsoft and do things like have a usable web client, namely Gmail in the browser, have a usable document and spreadsheet editor, and so on. And so that was the original idea of Chrome. And, and to, to get that working, they optimized the hell out of JavaScript. And um, I'm sure they hired uh, amazing people, both researchers and people who had built other important VMs in the past. And, and they made it happen. And now everything's on the web. But I'm going to assume that this, uh, that this repo is probably pretty intense. Um, so third party is Google's way of, of, this is where other people might put these in lib. These are like third party libraries that they depend on. GNI, I'm not sure I remember what that is. Custom depths. I feel like I've seen it, uh, but I forget. Basil has its own directory. I'm not sure why. Maybe this is just like Basil-y stuff that they needed at the time. And here's the source. I'm going to guess most stuff is in source. We have also infra which is maybe not important. Include has CPP, GC, I'm guessing garbage collection, lib platform, some V8 data stuff, V8 inspector, V8 profiler. These might be um, just like tooling and also samples. Should we look at hello world? GNI, what is GNI? Oh, this is, this is not related to the samples. So GNI has the V8.GNI. Hmm. VNI file format, Google something, something. The GN language introduction. It's an extensive built-in help system, which provides reference for every function and built-in variable. Okay. So this is some, I guess, help stuff and we don't need it. Let's see if we can find a V8, um, architecture diagram. I'm just going to open these willy nilly and see if we can determine anything interesting from them. So we initialize the environment, we compile, we generate bytecodes, we interpret the bytecodes and execute, and there's some optimization. So this just looks like, uh, like just in time compilation. There might be de-optimization. That's not so informative, but. Uh, so we have some JavaScript source code. It goes into a parser. There's an abstract syntax tree. This is all stuff we've seen before in other compiler type stuff. We have interpreter ignition. And then I don't know what ignition means, but, but it's going to generate some bytecode. We've got a compiler turbo fan, which makes optimized machine code. And I guess maybe it, that mixes with, with bytecode. This is a YouTube thumbnail because it's called Max Res Default. 
and uh, environment browser, Node.js, V8 engine. Okay. So this, the, these diagrams are just telling us that it's doing compilation. This is unrelated. That looks like maybe some machine learning stuff. Cool. This might be interesting. I don't know what TurboFan is, call stack execution context, heap memory allocation, Orinoco garbage collector, ignition, JS library, liftoff assembly. Let's look up these things. Liftoff assembly, Orinoco garbage collector, perhaps named after the song Orinoco flow. So here's the Orinoco thing. Um, there's some presentation. The garbage collector has a few essential tasks to identify. Uh, okay. So is there anything interesting that's going on here? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe we'll just keep these up in the, in the background. Lift off assembly. I don't know if this is finding anything. And what was the other one that I wanted to see? Turbo fan. Well, to riff V8, and how about lift off V8? I think this is going to save us time in the long run because uh, we'll probably see some of these code names in the code, you knowing Google. So uh, it would be nice to know what they are. In 2018, V8 6.9, nice, includes lift off, a new baseline compiler, WebAssembly. Lift off is now enabled by default on desktop systems. Since WebAssembly launched more than a year ago, adoption of the web has been steadily increasing. Adoption of the web, adoption on the web. Uh, so something about WebAssembly and benchmarking. What is TurboFan? It's one of the eight optimizing compilers, leveraging a concept called the sea of nodes. I will read sea of nodes and I will read the high level overview of TurboFan. And I won't look and I'll read them later. So now with that, um, let's dig in. I'm not sure what we really want to see. Let's see Hello World. We've seen, um, I think we look at Node. We saw somebody calling the, uh, the V8 code. We are including this lib platform stuff, isolate. I think is a, is a term. I think it's isolate as opposed to isolate. We initialize the ICUD, uh, ICU dev default location. I don't know what ICU is. Initialize external startup data, new default platform, initialize platform and initialize. This is just kind of boilerplate initialization. I'm not sure what all that does, but I think that probably some of it uh, makes it so that you can have different versions of V8 running in the, in the, on the same machine and they don't interfere with each other. Um, create a new isolate and make it the current one. And maybe also isolates are used to isolate tabs or something. So to, to, to uh, or, or different sites. So we create params and, uh, an array buffer allocator. It's some allocator, I guess, for allocating memory, and we're calling, calling isolate new on create params. Did we do anything with create params? I think these are just the default ones, perhaps. Or uh, then we have some block here. I don't know what this block is part of. I don't see like a function call, but maybe I'm missing something. We call isolate scope. So we're, I guess we're setting the isolate scope, the isolate scope to isolate to the isolate we created. Um, we're creating a stack allocated handle scope. So we're creating a handle scope for the isolate. And uh, oh, these look like just uh, function definitions or something. And then uh, we're going to enter the context and then create a new string containing the JavaScript source location. Uh, so isolate hello world, compile the source code calling v8 script compile to local checked. I don't know what to local checked. Maybe local means it's running locally and checked maybe means type checked or something along those lines and run the script, the script to get the result. So in C++, we could just run the script. 
to local checked and get the result, which is a V8 value. I guess you have to figure out what kind of value it is if we want to use the result in C++. And we convert the result to a UTF-8 string and print it. How do we know it's a UTF-8 string? I'm not sure. Um, I guess we can convert anything to a string because it's, because it's JavaScript, right? What's, what's it going to do? JavaScript is basically all strings all the time. Uh, and so on. Okay, so what is interesting to me here, I think we should probably take a look at compile, V8 script compile. So the script is the is the model for JavaScript. Script run is going to execute the JavaScript. There's this isolate stuff, which is probably important for um, like embedding JavaScript into your application. I think I remember seeing stuff about embeddings before. Not machine learning embeddings, but some other kind of embedding. Um, all right, let's see compile. We have API, assembly, JS, base, baseline, big int, code gen. I'll open code gen. So compiler we'll look at. We have the de-optimizer. I'm, I'm mostly interested in when we would want to de-optimize. Let's ask Gemini. So uh, when does the V8 JavaScript engine uh, de-optimize? We'll come back to that in a second. Fuzzily, fuzzily, I guess is a pun on the fuzzily pasta and fuzzing. Handles, heap, IC. I don't know what IC is. Interpreter. We look at interpreter, lib sampler, maglev. Maglev within the context of Google is a is a uh, load balancing thing. I'm not sure what's up with it here. Regular expression, profiler, roots, runtime. I guess we'll look at run. We'll open runtime and sandbox. We may not actually look at it. Tasks, temporal, third party, torque. I don't know what torque is. Uh, WebAssembly. I guess we'll open WebAssembly. The DBC script. I didn't. I didn't see script. Let's go back here and see for um, if there's anything we have include. Please tell me there's not a separate include directory. Here's V8 script, the header. Maybe you do need to have a separate include directory in some cases. I don't really know the, the details. We'll look at a couple, of the, a couple of these headers. V8 value, I guess we should look at. Let's go over here. And V8.h. Uh, that might be too intense. How many lines? 88 lines? Okay. Not bad. So we're including all the things, all the headers that you can ever imagine. Uh, and then in the namespace V8, we have a platform class in shell.cc, a simple shell that takes a list of expressions on the command line and executes them. Okay, so I don't have, I could download this and run Basil on it, but um, I mean, that, that's interesting. I guess you can just execute uh, JavaScript from, from V8 if you have the source code and maybe you can download the utility. WebAssembly we'll get to, let's do the uh, more fundamental ones first. Let's look at, I guess, script and value. So there's two, like there's two, uh, I go back and forth um, intentionally between two different approaches when one thing depends on another thing. So you have script, which probably depends on values because there should be the values in the script. Um, and so there's a question of, should you look at value first because you'll need it to understand script or should you look at first to see how values are used so that when you look at value, you have a sense of like, like how's the API actually used in the way you want to understand it. And I, I kind of do both, um, but I find that often looking at them out of order is more informative, especially for getting a quick understanding. Okay, so in namespace V8, we have, um, we're going to refer to functions, class, objects, primitive arrays, and scripts. And then we have this like internal part of the namespace. We have a background deserialization task, script streaming data. We have V8 export. This is passed back to the embedder as part of host import module dynamically callback for module loading. Uh, things like get ID, not so important. We have some status, uninstantiated, instantiating, instantiated. 
evaluated, evaluating, and errored. The different states that a module can be in, okay, so these are at the module level, corresponds to the states used in ECMAScript, except that evaluated is split into evaluated and errored, indicating success or failure, respectively. You can get the identity hash, synthetic module evaluation steps. You can figure out whether we are in a synthetic module, etc. So this is just the header. We don't see the implementation here. So here this is, okay, so I guess the V8 export is some like annotation. So script compiler is that class script. So script has what? You can compile it, passing in the context, the source code as a string, and you get this as a result. V8, and, oh no, 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 you don't get this as a result. You get a maybe local script as a result. And we will warn if you're not used. And then I don't know what the script origin thing is, like, but it seems to be, I don't know if it's an in parameter or an out parameter. And then we have this maybe local run. So you can run giving it a context or you can run giving it a context and a host defined options. We don't know what local is yet. Local handle. So I'm guessing maybe this is the place where local is defined. Let's check that out. So we have class local base, a base class for local handles. Its implementation depends on whether the direct local support is enabled. When it is, a local handle contains a direct pointer to the referenced object. Otherwise, it contains an indirect pointer. We have local vector, local base, uh, class local. Where is it defined though? Let's try searching for class local. Is it in heap scavenger and mark sweep? So it maybe uh, maybe it's related to the to the heap. Let's look here, scavenger.h. So class local has this um, uh, this local thing which takes a promotion list. You can push a regular object. You can push a large object, and the object is a tagged heap object. You can pop it. Uh, I guess from the from the heap, from the position list, I guess. It, uh, you can check whether the global pool is empty, et cetera. Hmm. So let's go back to the Gemini about uh, de-optimization. Uh, the de-optimizes in scenarios where the assumptions made during optimization turn out to be invalid. This typically happens when the code's behavior deviates from what the engine predicted. Here are some common reasons. So the hidden class mis mismatch, incorrect type assumptions, function inlining. Okay. Um, and uh, how about uh, V8 JavaScript and local? We'll put local in quotes so that DuckDuckGo doesn't get rid of it. Um, so it has something to do with embeddings. This document is intended for C++ programmers who want to embed the VA JavaScript engine within a C++ application. A local handle is a pointer to an object. All V8 objects are accessed using handles. They are necessary because of the way V8 garbage collector works. Okay, so the handles may be some kind of, you might perhaps think of it as an indirection. It's a kind of container, I guess, that's visible or useful to the garbage collector that allows you to get it outside. Here we go. <laughs> that's literally the next line. A handle scope can be thought of as a container for any number of handles. A handle scope is a container for any number of handles. When you're finished with your handles, instead of deleting each one individually, you can simply delete their scope. Okay, and a context is an execution environment that allows separate, unrelated JavaScript code to run in a single instance of V8. I don't know why it's called local, but... 
Local handles are held on a stack and are deleted when the appropriate destructor is called. These handles lifetime is determined by a handle scope, which is okay. So it's locally scoped, which is often created at the beginning of the function call. Okay. So that's about scoping and that's why it's in the garbage collector. Here's the web assembly stuff. Um, uh, we have this compiled web assembly module, which you can do some stuff with. And we're just, uh, it's not so in not interesting enough. Let's, uh, I mean, it is interesting, but it's too technical to, to dive into in six minutes, seven minutes. So we're going to not look at it right now. Um, so here's a V8 value. We've got a few classes here that we're referring to primitive, numeric, big int, int32, integer, number, object, string, uint32. I don't see uint36 or, or, or 64. Um, and I wonder if these are essentially the, uh, the objects we're working with. So everything is a data, a superclass of all JavaScript values and objects. We can ask if it's undefined, whether it's null. So I guess things are nullable is null or undefined is true. This is like, uh, I guess objects can be converted or, or yeah, conversion to Boolean. Yeah. Okay. So this is, if you Booleanize an object, whether it's Booleanized to true or false return, whether it's a symbol, which is equivalent to type of value is equal to is triple equal to symbol, the literal symbol is big int, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just, uh, kind of type information and we have these like is uh, predicates that we can call on, on, on things. You can try to convert things to a number and so on and so forth. And what else do we have? Anything interesting? We have a type check witness. This should be, I guess, maybe a proof that the type check is as, as described and we used to avoid repeated expensive type checks for groups of objects that are expected to be similar. For example, when, Blink converts a bunch of JavaScript objects to script wrappable after it has instance check by making use of V8 internal hidden classes. Okay, so this is some sort of uh, indication that, that type check has happened and it can be used to shortcut type checking, it looks like. Here's WebAssembly. We haven't gotten into WebAssembly yet, and I don't know enough about it personally to make much sense of it, given the, the constrained amount of time we have. Here is Torque. I don't even know what Torque is. Maybe we'll just look up what Torque is. Torque. A V8 Torque. The language that allows, it's a language, I guess it allows developers contributing to the V8 project to express changes in the VM by focusing on their intent on the intent of their changes to the VM rather than preoccupying themselves with unrelated implementation details. So I guess for it's for trying to make it easy to, to translate the ECMAScript specification into an implementation on V8, but powerful enough to express the low level V8 optimization tricks in a robust way. Okay. So that's, uh, seems like a nice tool for developers is essentially what that comes to. Here's the V8 sandbox. We have a glossary. I don't think I've seen a glossary before. Let me move this chat out of the way for a moment. All right. So a sandbox is a region of virtual address space, typically one TB. I don't know if it's terabyte containing all untrusted V8 objects. This is implemented as a large contiguous virtual address space reservation using the appropriate operating system primitives. Address space, re address space reservations are cheap on all modern OSs. Okay, so a trusted object is one containing sensitive data or code located outside of the sandbox. You can expose trusted objects. We have pointers. A compressed pointer is a pointer that is guaranteed to point into V8's four gigabyte heap area inside the sandbox. So it's not only inside the sandbox, which I think it said was one terabyte, but also inside of the four gigabyte heap. These are stored as 32 bit offsets from the start of the heap area. They were originally de developed to reduce V8's memory footprint. Okay. Uh, then we have an uncompressed full pointer, pointer which is a full 64-bit pointer into a heap object. These are regular raw pointers, which uh, you get by decompressing them. And we have a sandbox pointer, which is just guaranteed to point into the sandbox. 
is a 40-bit offset when the sandbox is 1TP large that is added to the base of the sandbox when loaded. Okay, and then a protected pointer is a pointer that can be, not be modified by an attacker, only used between trusted objects. Okay, so these are various types of pointers and they have some guarantees. And I guess the guarantees are probably relatively easy to, to see how they're enforced. I don't know if there's any um, any advanced wizardry or if the wizardry is mainly in the design. The V8 sandbox, when enabled, V8 reserves a large region of virtual address space, the sandbox, and places most of its objects inside it. It is then assumed that an, an attacker can, by exploiting a vulnerability in V8, corrupt memory inside the sandbox arbitrarily and from different threads. And so this is more stuff about the, the, the sandbox here in the pointers, I think. We can initialize it. Uh, we can check whether it's initialized. So we can get the size of the sandbox. We have a page allocator, returns a page allocator instance that allocates pages inside the sandbox and so on and so forth. So this is cool. We'll see what else we can see. We won't look too much at the implementation of the sandbox itself. Here's the runtime. We have runtime, array, atomics, bigins, classes, collections, a compiler, um, Futex. These are kind of standard, I guess, runtimey things, uh, similar to to languages. I guess we'll look just at a couple of these. Uh, the runtime compiler. This is some logging stuff. We have this runtime function macro, and we're uh, passing in runtime compile lazy. And we've got this handle scope stuff. This is like a, a, a assertion, essentially D check. And I don't know what all this stuff is. We're checking some stack limit stuff. Or maybe this is defining the runtime function via this macro. And maybe this is the name of it. And this is the implementation or something along those lines. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's what's going on. Here's runtime futex. I don't, uh, this looks like more definitions. Runtime atomics, num waiters for testing. These are maybe runtime functions for handling the, the futex. Runtime scopes. These must be runtime scopes and we're out of time. I'm, I am curious what maglev is, is doing here. Let's see if we can find out what's up in the header. We have maybe, maybe handle code compile. Maglev compile. How about maglev? Maglev is V8's fastest optimizing JIT. But why? Why are there two Google Maglev projects? I don't know. But that's what they've done. Uh, here's, and we're out of time, but here's the interpreter directory. There's some bytecode. We could look at the bytecode. Uh, but we're not going to. So execution, de-optimizer, compiler. We've seen lots of compilers, code gen, and we're just not going to get to it because that's that's life. So that's a little a little peek at V8. We're doing 30 minute time boxes uh, until we reach the end of our uh, of our backlog. And thanks for watching.